go. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Susan M. Hart Servideo. I am with the Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Ocean County. And tonight we are um, proud to present Bruce Crawford um, giving us a talk on um, pruning, not a mysterious art. And with us also as our um, host and hostess, uh, excuse me, panelists, I have Patty Dixon from Ocean County and Rebecca McGron. If I said that correct from Hunterton, so yep, um, in New Jersey. So if anybody has any questions, uh, we're all in extension. So you can always give us a holler. And Bruce, I'm going to stop there because I'm getting feedback. So it might be my microphone. So okay, I'm, I'm going to let you take it away. All Thank right. You, Bruce. So good. Good evening, everybody. So uh, glad to know that there's so many people interested in pruning. So with uh, uh, a real brief background on myself. Uh, I have always been a very much a hands on person. I had my own business for 20 some years, which dealt a lot with pruning. And I have, uh, over the course of 15 years, I worked at Rutgers Gardens and now um, uh, um, overseeing home hoard and public court in uh, New Jersey. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, so anyway, this is, this is a passion of mine. So, uh, and um, I'll be happy to work it through. There we go. Um, answer if we don't get to all the questions tonight, I am happy to answer anything via email. And so the my email will be on the last image as well as it's on the handout. So, um, and I sort of always make this a joke. It's not a mysterious art at all, but I remember when I was a little kid, I was driving along and I was looking at the back of one house and, um, and it was in Hocus, New Jersey, and they had a bunch of, of uh, plants very similar to this. They were taxes that were sheared into cones. And I kept trying to figure out what was the purpose for that. And uh, this, of course, is down at Longwood Gardens where they did a topiary garden. So, uh, so if you're into topiary, then shearing is going to be um, your thing. We're not going to talk too much about shearing tonight because um, it's obviously not a very natural look. So if you're looking to do something more architectural, um, it works great. The drawback to shearing, as you can see in the cone to the right, is that when you cut the leaves, it tends to create, uh, it cuts them obviously, and it creates a little bit of necrosis or a brown haze. And that's especially true if you do that on boxwood. So it, it turns them sort of an off color. Um, so that's why I tend to not prefer the shearing, but uh, it, it does have advantages. And this was a garden up in Rhode Island, and this lady loved to shear everything. And I thought it was awesome because it was fun. I mean, that's what it was all about. It was whimsy, it was fun. And so I, I don't see anything wrong with this. It's Pac-Man underneath the window. I mean, that's great. So uh, um, this is a little bit detracting though. Um, and this is one of the things that we always do when we have two windows, we always like to put a nose in the middle of it. Um, and then, and, and this is the other problem I have with <laughs> using head shears is that we sort of become mindless with it. So we just, you know, they're going away and we just sort of buzz over the top and we buzz over the next one. We don't stop to think about the total composition of the design. So what was what was the design to be? And so here, this was supposed to be a mass of azaleas on the corner, and instead um, they turned up into individual little uh, plants. So that's not the uh, the intention. So, um, so anyway, so it's something to think about as you're doing this. If you're looking for a book, um, this it's it's a little bit on the pricey side, but uh, Edward Gilman is out of the University of Florida. And uh, his book is probably uh, one of the best. And so I have some of the images from it tonight uh, given by, to me by Jason Grabowski, who uh, helped edit the book and uh, work with him. So, um, so anyway, so it, it's one of the best. So if you're looking for one, go with that. And if you're looking for tools, uh, I recommend a bypass pruner, and, uh, which acts like a scissor where the blade actually goes past the anvil, uh, not uh, on top of it. And use a triad saw. A triad saw are uh, obviously it has three edges to it. It is best to replace the saw blade. So when you buy the saw, make sure that you uh, buy several spare blades to go with it because they're impossible to sharpen. Uh, bypass pruners, you know, I have Felco, but you can use Corona, any brand that you want. That's up to you. Um, I pick the uh, Felcos because they're easy to disassemble and to sharpen. So. Uh, and you do need to sharpen. So I just wanted to go through this for a couple seconds on sharpening uh, because it, it is important. And uh, so if you look at this blade, um, it's totally flat on one side and it's beveled on the other. So it's not like a pocket knife, which is beveled on both sides or a kitchen knife. So this actually 
Um, if you can get a, uh, a diamond impregnated piece of plastic, which is in the upper left hand corner, um, you can buy them at any hardware store, or the box store, they're all out there. And they are, but the nice thing about it is it remains flat. And so you lay the flat portion of the blade on top of it and just move it around. You put some water on top of it. Doesn't need to, it could also be dry, but I like a little water on it. And then it always brings up a burr and that burr will come about on the side that has a bevel to it. So then on a Arkansas stone or some stone that you would like to use, um, you just pass that blade over it a couple of times and it takes that burr off. And that's how you sharpen it, because a lot of people try to bevel both sides, and that doesn't work. And then they also have this pocket on the anvil right in here, and that's meant for grease. And you want to use white lithium grease, which again, you can get anywhere, it's hardware stores, uh, automotive uh, stores. Um, put a little bit of the white lithium grease in that uh, uh, well there, and then put them back together, and you're off and going. And you can see how shiny the blade is. So. Uh, and that, for me, will last about um, two months because I do a lot of pruning and work. But um, if you get out and prune once a year, it'll uh, uh, sharpening the blade will last uh, quite a long time. Also, one thing I should point out is, uh, can we see it? Um, hmm, yeah, it's difficult. But right in the back of the blade, uh, there's a little notch right about there, and that notch is meant for cutting wire. You don't want to use any of this blade for cutting wire. And so, uh, but right there, there's a little notch that's intended for cutting florist wire or wire out in the field. So, um, so again, this is a, a handy tool to have. And if you actually happen to, uh, or someone, you loan it and somebody misuses it, you can buy replacement blades for it. So. So this is sort of a mentor to keep in mind. Uh, shrubs you prune for beauty, trees you prune for safety. Because obviously if something breaks out of a shrub, it's only going to fall on the ground. If something falls out of the tree, then it hurts. So, um, so you always want to keep that in mind. And we're going to touch a little bit on tr uh, tree pruning, especially as you get a tree started. So shrubs for beauty, and here we have a pepper bush, Clethra, and uh, one of the pink flowered forms. Um, I should note that if anyone has clethra, it doesn't respond well to heavy pruning. So this one you want to prune moderately. So each each plant more or less has its uh, finicky moments and um, what they like and they don't like. Um, time to prune. Uh, when the pruners are sharp, there's certain merit to that. You know, you see a broken branch, sure, uh, prune it right off. Uh, if you're pruning for foliage, form, flower, um, or fantastic stem coloration, I was trying to come up with four Fs, um, then that varies. So we'll talk about that. Uh, do not prune during mid-August into uh, late September, early October. So that's what happens when you prune. Obviously, you remove the foliage. The plant responds by going, gee, you just cut off my foliage. I need more leaves. And it responds by putting out more foliage. And what will happen if you prune it late in the season is that it will uh, push a lot of growth and it will not harden off before frost. And so what will happen is uh, it'll still be actively growing into November and then all that wood will be killed back or as in a worst case scenario, which happened to a winter sweet that we had at the gardens uh, years back, um, it was pruned in August uh, radically and then it was still pushing growth in November and a plant that was put in the ground in 1930 something uh, died in 2000 something because um, it was still actively growing and wasn't hardened off for winter. So that's especially true of marginally hardy plants. So you do not want to prune it during that uh, period of time unless it's a broken branch for obvious. And then for flowers, you also have to keep in mind is the plant bloom on old wood, which was uh, formed last fall or late last summer or on current season wood. So hedges, since we started out with topiaries, we'll go back to Longwood Gardens. Uh, and again, hedges can be sheared and uh, it, it'll create a very architectural effect and that can work for you if that's what you need. Um, but the drawback to shearing is that obviously the snow lays right on top of the plants. And by doing so, it will tend to, um, you know, it could break up some of the foliage. Now this year, this really is a damage here. So that's just sort of, that could be easily trimmed up with a hedge trimmer and it'll look just fine. But sometimes you'll get major parts of the uh, the plant breaking out, and uh, that's not what you want. So uh, so that's a drawback to uh, shearing with um, electric head shears. Uh, but it has pluses. So this is up at Chicago Botanic, and I always like this. So here you have a bald cypress in the background, 
uh, Taxodium disticum, which is a full-size tree, but it takes pruning really well. And uh, a U down below, a taxus. And I like the contrast between the fluffiness of the taxodium and the shearing of the of the U. So it it can work to your advantage. So I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying uh, be careful. Uh, here's another bald cypress taxodium, which um, has been uh, sheared into a hedge. So this was up at the Morton Arboretum outside of Chicago, and you can make hedges out of things that you never possibly thought of, and uh, which I I really encourage because we're we sort of think about Japanese holly, we think about uh, taxis, uh, we think about privet, but we don't seem to go beyond that very much. So there's a lot of good material that you can use for hedging if you'd like. Uh, this is Atlanta Botanic Garden, and uh, the shearing actually gives that box hedge the visual weight uh, that really works in this composition. And uh, even in, the, in February, in the middle of winter, that sheared boxwood hedge, again, is important because, again, that that density of the shearing gives it visual weight, and that's important. So, uh, if this is if this is a, uh, a design uh, influence or a design style that you want, um, again, shearing will do that for you. Uh, think about some other things. So, here's Cornus moss, which is Cornelian cherry dogwood, and it is uh, native to Europe. So, it's a it's a large shrub to borderline small tree, depending upon how you prune it. Um, it is, uh, it's an interesting plant. It blooms before forsythia. It uh, is a petalous, which means it doesn't have any petals. It just has the anthers, which give you that nice yellow effect early in the season. But, uh, and I really no, never paid too much attention to it till I went to Chicago Botanic Garden. And I saw this hedge when I first, this is going back uh, 15 or so years ago. And, uh, or actually more than that. And uh, so I ran in and I had, I gave myself a certain amount of time to run through the whole place. So I looked over, I saw this hedge and I said, ah, it's euonymus. And I didn't really pay any attention to it. And as I was leaving, I suddenly looked at it and said, whoa, wait a minute, that's not euonymus. And I walked over to it and realized that it was um, Cornelian cherry dogwood and it had been hand pruned. If they had used electric shears, the foliage would have been cut. And the foliage damage that you see here is actually from a late season frost. So they had hand pruned this to give it that effect. And when you think about it, the time it takes to cut this by hand, um, it takes a little longer to cut it, but it takes a lot less on the cleanup because all you're doing is taking the cutting and then throwing it into a can and it goes really quite quickly. So, um, and then you don't have the raking, all that mess and fuss afterwards. So, uh, so this is uh, years ago at the gardens. And uh, so the uh, students are working on this hedge. And so it took five, give or take five students, an hour and a half to prune this hedge, which is give or take about 40 feet long. And there it is completed. Uh, in the winter time, you could prune the same hedge in an hour and 10 minutes. And so without the foliage, you can see exactly where to make the cut. Um, you wanna obviously make the cut above a flower bud. So those are that, Right here, you can see the flower bud. And uh, the whole thing was done in an hour and 10 minutes. And so, you know, again, you know, what do you do in the wintertime? It's, it's a pretty quiet time of the year. So this gives us the opportunity to go out and do some pruning in January, February, or March, when otherwise it would take an awful long time to do it in the summer. And think about it, is if you had perennials or something on the other side while you're cutting this, You'd be stepping on the plants, whereas if you're doing it in the wintertime, um, you're still stepping on them, but it's it's dormant. So, uh, and again, you can see that it comes alight with flowers um, as a hedge. So, uh, so anyway, think, give some thought to uh, pruning in the wintertime. This is up at Wave Hill, and this is a European hornbeam hedge in front of a uh, Western arborvitaes that are let, just let grown loose. Uh, arborvitaes were put in to hide the electric wires in the background. And uh, the, I think the interesting thing here is that uh, the, the hedge slopes slightly from left to uh, right to left, excuse me, downhill. And uh, when Louis Bauer took over as the director of horticulture, that bothered him. I never, I never even saw it. I still really barely see it, but he, that bothered him. So he decided to level them. And uh, so the nice thing about European hornbeam is that it tolerates a heavy pruning really well. And so he, and that part that's high in the middle, he left it high because it sort of disrupts the eye as you go from the right to the left. And uh, he stepped it down. And the other reason for that center portion is actually sort of blocks the entrance way, which is on the other side. So that's how you can come and go. So 
Um, so the point I'm getting at here is there's a lot of great hedging material out there other than uh, sort of the common material that we uh, typically see in New Jersey. The other thing I should point out here is here's the stone. You can see it right there by the ladder and they sheared this. So this was all electric sheared. And uh, so there's the stone. And then a couple of years later, when it got too large, which happens, they took it way back. So notice here the stone is, as you can see, a good 14, 16 inches of it. Whereas here, you barely see any of it. So they took it back significantly. So um, that is, a, is the, uh, the makings of a good hedge plant because you're allowed to go into the plant, cut it back heavily, and the plant will restock, respond beautifully. Uh, the other thing which I thought was interesting here is that they put pieces of rebar on the corner uh, to sort of showcase where the, um, the end point is. So as the plant gets bigger, they're able to prune back to that point again and again and again. So they uh, always know where the corner points are. So uh, um, again, that would be uh, a challenge if you were electric shearing and you hit that with the shears, but if you're doing uh, hand pruning, um, it's not a problem whatsoever. And I think even in the wintertime, deciduous hedges um, have a certain beauty to them. And uh, it's, it's nice how the, the lacing of the branches catches the snowfall. So uh, anyway, just thoughts to keep. But let's say that you have a, a U hedge, which we're looking at right here, or a holly hedge that's gotten out of control. Um, certain plants you're able to cut back hard. And uh, by hard, I mean you're able to take four, five, six feet off or more, and the plant will uh, break dormant buds down below and recover. Now, this plant here, this was a hedge, obviously, and it had been pruned back the year prior. So this is one year into the rejuvenation pruning. And uh, you notice that one, some of the plants didn't respond really, really well. And it's, it's not all of them. You can see that they're all doing fine down here. It just happens to be this one cluster right here. And there's probably something there that's wrong. It's either a soil that's really dense. Uh, it, it's a low spot, which accumulates water. Somehow those plants are under stress. They're still gonna come around. They're still fine. Uh, one of the questions I always get is if you, some of the wood doesn't respond, can you go back and cut it out by hand? Uh, with a saw or some, something, and, and yes, the answer is yes. You can always go back in and remove the dead wood. Um, but uh, in time, of course, it will be covered over and you won't even see it. Another note to take, if you do this, always make sure that you cut the wood back uh, to a good six to uh, 12 inches below where you want the hedge to be, because you want all these cuts to be buried within the plant, not to be showcased on the surface. So uh, I think that's an important if you have red stem dogwoods, uh, they need, or willows that we'll be touching on, they need uh, almost uh, yearly pruning. So either you prune it back uh, a third each year, take a third of the oldest wood out. So that means after three years, you'll be starting all over again, be new wood coming in. Uh, or you cut the whole thing to the ground if you don't have deer. And of course, everyone's probably laughing at this point because who doesn't have deer? But um, the, if you leave, uh, just take out a third of the wood, uh, the existing wood will actually protect the new wood as it comes up from the base from deer browse. And so um, it really works quite successfully. So, um, so anyway, something to keep in mind. But again, uh, a lot of people put in these red stem uh, dogwoods and go, gee, they've turned gray. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that after three to four years, the stems turn gray like you see here. So they need a rejuvenation pruning. So midwinter fire should look like that if it's pruned uh, seasonally. So uh, this is up at Crystal Springs in uh, Sussex County where they take out about a third of the wood each year. And again, there's a lot of deer up in that neck of the woods. So they take out about a third of the oldest uh, wood and then allow new wood to sucker up from the base. And so by doing this annually, um, again, in a three-year period of time, you have a totally new plant. Uh, same thing with the willows. The red stem willows are very popular in Europe. They haven't really caught on as much here. But again, here's flame, um, and here it is after it's been pruned properly. So again, um, these are plants that you can't just put in and expect something good to happen. Uh, here's Britsensis. And so uh, great color in the wintertime. It looks like it's on fire. It's fantastic. Uh, but then, you know, and here you see the, the base of it over here. So each year it's cut back hard um to sort of this and they call it stooling which is one of the common names for it uh, if you cut it all back at once because you're cutting it back to the height of a stool leg uh coppicing is another name for it and uh it then just breaks dormant buds and that this is something you want to do right about now or a couple of weeks from now 
Uh, blueberries, um, same more or less treatment. Um, you don't cut um, it all back in one year, but again, uh, you take out about a third of the wood. So you take out the oldest wood uh, to encourage new wood to come up, and that in turn will give you the uh, freshest and plumpest blueberries. And so, um, so it's you know something to bear in mind. And again, um, blueberries form the flower buds on the previous year's wood. So uh, you don't want to take the whole plant to the ground because you'll be removing all the flower buds. Um, but uh, but if you take out a third or um, a portion of it each year, um, then you'll a, get blueberries, but B will get new wood that'll come on that will bear a proper fruit. This is not how you prune a forsythia. So, uh, and so this was sort of the classic case where the forsythia was put at the corner of the driveway and the road. Um, and then all of a sudden, the person that owned the house couldn't see over, beyond, or around the forsythia, so decided just to chop it in, sort of in half, um, or even more than in half. And um, so that yields the flower display like that the following spring, which is uh, far from exciting. And uh, uh, the other thing is this was a, a person who um, sheared the plant and uh, again, uh, created a lot of dense frameworks for the plant and that held the snow this winter because it sort of again had that sheared uh, hedge like effect to it and it crumbled under the snow load. So um and that's also another drawback to this is that on most all your multi-stem shrubs from ducias to lilacs to forsythia uh, the older stems uh, develop clots they're called tyloses and um, those clots then uh, limit the flow of sugars to the roots and water to the uh to the stems uh, the, to the tips of the stems and uh, and then over time actually it produces less and less flowers and it ultimately dies. So when you shear it, you're not removing the oldest wood, which will ultimately die. You're keeping all the dead wood in there, uh, which obviously also creates a flower display like that. So uh, you really want to thin the plant. So by taking out a third of the plant each year and the oldest wood on forsythia and most weeping plants is towards the bottom. So uh, so the youngest wood goes straight up and then over time, uh, with, the, with the impact of gravity, it sort of weeps on over, and so you want to go along and uh, trim off those oldest stems, which are the most uh, weeping or pendulous. Uh, the other drawback to forsythia and some other shrubs is that they tend to root. So you're, originally you had a plant that was uh, three or four feet in diameter, five feet in diameter. Next thing you know, it's 20 feet in diameter, and you can't figure out how it got so big. And that's because the tips of the shoots rooted. So what you want to do is go around and make sure that uh, anything that's hitting the ground that's potentially rooted is removed, because uh, otherwise the uh, you'll have forsythia in your entire back part. So anyway, uh, you can see this plant here. The snow load uh, drifted through the plant, so it didn't impact the plant or break it. So and again, forsythia is going to have a wild look to it. And even after you take um, a third or so of the stems out each year. The plant still looks great, so it has no impact on the flowering capacity whatsoever. And if you need something that only grows to be three feet tall, get gold tied. I mean, it's a dwarf compact form, and uh, so you don't need to shear it to keep it low. It automatically will stay low for you. So that's just how it grows. And you do the same thing for Dutzia, old-fashioned uh, slender Dutzia, um, mock orange, the same exact uh, thing. Exocorda, the pearl bush, same thing. Uh, lilacs, the same thing. Lilacs, you know, you have a little more time, so you don't take out a third of the wood each year, uh, but you sort of evaluate the plant and uh, attractive flowers. But you look at the tips of the stems, and if they have large uh, plump buds like these, then that uh, branch or stem is still growing vigorously, and so the, you don't need to cut it back. If, as you can see on the stem on the right, it's old, it's decayed, it's producing a lot of very, very tiny uh, floral buds at the tip, then you're not gonna have a great floral display. So by cutting it back and removing those older stems, you're gonna encourage more vigorous stems to come up from the base. And that's exactly what you wanna do. So it's just like the forsythia, it's just a little bit bigger, it's a little bit more woody, but uh, otherwise it's quite the same. And uh, here you can see a before and after, you can see this center stem right here, which is rather scraggly. Uh, that got cut back to give or take about 12 inches tall, which is what you want to do. And uh, that will encourage new wood to come up from the base. And this is sort of interesting because here's a plant which is give or take probably uh, 75, 80 years old. 
And you notice that it's dying out in the middle. So it has all the stems right around the outside edge and nothing in the middle. So it's just like ornamental grasses that tend to donut in the middle and a lot of perennials. Uh, the woody shrubs do the same thing. So they always grow out. Uh, they don't grow back in again. And after a period of time, once you get to 100 years, um, you may want to just say, let's, it's uh, the plant's life expectancy has expired and let's put a new plant in because obviously the center of it's quite, quite dead. Um, this was actually probably the first plant I ever tried to prune. Uh, I was going back to high school. So this is a smoke bush, uh, Cotinus. And um, if anyone's got one of these, you try to prune it and you get it all nice and evened up and has a nice habit to it. Next thing you know, it shoots out another uh, uh, piece of growth and it's all misbalanced again. And then you go, what are, now what do I do? And uh, so if you want the flowers, you can't prune it heavy because it flowers on previous year's wood. But if you're not so much concerned about the, uh, the flowers, but more about the foliage, then again, just like with the willows, you can copus it heavily uh, or stool it and cut it back to give or take 12 inches tall. And again, all this wood up top here, this is all brand new wood and uh, that was produced the following year. And you can use these for staking stuff in the garden. So it works great for one year. So it's not really uh, rot resistant beyond one year, but it makes great stakes for one season. And, uh, and then the following year you get this. So it uh, produces a nice purple or a golden shrub, depending upon which smoke bush you have and uh, just wonderfully uh, attractive uh, form to it. So, uh, so again, you've, you've given away the flowers, but on the same token, now you've got deep purple foliage uh, that will last all season long. Uh, I even did this on one of the uh, red buds. And so this is, excuse me, obviously hearts of gold and um, you know, produces golden chartreuse foliage in May into early June, but then by the time you get to August, it starts to turn more green. It loses its yellow uh, impact. And so what we did one year is we cut it off about uh, a foot above the uh, graft union and uh, proceeded to, to cut it back or stool it. And so, um, so again, here's what it looks like in the winter time. And so we, we cut it back hard. Uh, here's a bud, which will break dormancy this year. So whatever the diameter of the stem is, you want to make sure that you are that far above the bud because otherwise it tends to die back. But if you're the, the diameter of the stem above the bud, that will uh, pretty much ensure that that bud will break dormancy and then shoot up. And it'll look like that, give or take in late May, early June. And it will look like that in August into September. So you'll get this golden shrub, uh, which is very attractive. Keeps putting out new foliage all season long. Um, with the shorter days come the fall and the cooling, it's, it slows down and, um, and the process begins all over again the next year. So anyway, I, it's a technique that is uh, very popular in Europe, but it's not used uh, heavily in, in uh, the States. And, and I think it's certainly worth a go. So uh, quite fun. Uh, you can do it a lot of different things. You can do it on Polonia. This is down at uh, uh, Scott Arboretum, Swarthmore. And uh, they cut them back hard, obviously, each year. And it produces these dinner plate sized leaves, which uh, again add bold texture. Uh, this is Empress Tree of China. Uh, hibiscus. Um, so this, I was working with a, a group of Girl Scouts and they were cutting back the uh, uh, calamint here in the Russian sage. And, uh, and again, this material you, you cut back to give or take four inches or just to the ground. And um, I didn't really keep an eye on them and they got into the hibiscus and they started cutting back on the Rose of Sharon to about 12 inches tall too. And, um, and of course, since Rosa Sharon blooms on new wood, it really didn't impact the flower production whatsoever. And actually, um, I think probably improved the, uh, the appearance. So, so again, if you have a Rosa Sharon, which is overgrown, um, you can go right back in and uh, cut it back hard uh, right now, and it will flush up and uh, give you flowers this year. Uh, the other drawback to Rose of Sharon though, is that they seed like crazy. So sometimes, you bought um, a blue one and then end up with a white one because uh, the seedlings. Um, so you just have to be careful. Uh, Vitex, uh, chase tree, another plant which uh, was quite popular years back, seems to have um, faded, but um, it should come back a little bit because it's, it's quite deer resistant and uh, uh, blooms in the middle of summer, which is a plus and a minus. It's a minus because when people are in garden centers, they don't see it blooming in May. 
Um, but again, it gives a nice impact to the, uh, the shrub border in the middle of summer. Um, it's also, if you're pruning it back this time of year, you want to use gloves too, because um, um, the, the chemicals released from the plant actually impact your, your hormones, and that's why they call it chase tree. So uh, interesting plant to do a little research on. So at Longwood Gardens, they cut it back to about um, four feet tall. But so this will it'll flush two feet of new growth. And so instead of the plant growing to be uh, 12 feet tall, uh, it'll only grow to be at six feet tall, or you can cut it back more to uh, limit the size of the plant. So again, since it blooms on current seasons wood, this plant you can be quite harsh on and still get good flower production. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's interesting to see how the plants respond. And then people always want to know, how do you plant, how do you prune hydrangeas? What, what's the key to them? And it really depends upon the species and where it originated in the world. So uh, did it originate in a really cold winter location or did it originate in a warmer, uh, more maritime or southern location? So hydrangea arborescence, uh, which means that the plant sort of looks arbor-like or tree-like in the winter form, uh, is actually native to New Jersey. And so it's uh, Carolinas up to uh, uh, southern parts of Canada, west to um, Chicago. So, so this plant you can actually cut to the ground because it'll bloom on new wood. And so this is um, Annabelle, which uh, is the bell of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So that's how it got its name. And if you, all you have to do is cut it back like this. There's, you have no concern, no care. Um, you can ask uh, if there's a, a high school student next door is making look looking to make a few dollars. This is a great job for that person. So uh, just cut them down. So you don't have to have prior experience in horticulture to do this. And that's what it looked like in March. And uh, this is what it looked like the following summer. So this is very easy to take care of. There's a lot of great cultivars. Uh, Haas Halo is a new one that came out a couple of years ago, which has really, really large flowers. White Dome is another one. Uh, both Haas Halo and White Dome um, have a lot of fertile florets, so they're actually beneficial for our native pollinators. Problem with Annabelle, if you're into native pollinators, is that a lot of the uh, flor florets are sterile, so that's what gives you those large hortensia-shaped uh, flower heads or, or uh, you know, more or less balls. So uh, uh, this is Hydrangea macrophylla, which is native to Japan and uh, parts of Korea, and the uh, it edges the uh, rings the aisles, so it is. Uh, maritime in origin, so it does really well at the Jersey Shore. Uh, this one turns color, obviously, so it's blue if you have an acidic soil, it's pink if you have an alkaline soil. And these need to be thin, so these actually require um, a little bit of focus and time. So this is the hortensia types, which um, all the sterile florets have become um, these infertile florets and give you these large domes. And so when you look at the plant in the wintertime, or right now, um, and you can do this for a few more weeks yet, but you don't want to do them all at once because it gets really tedious. <coughs> so the stems that are cinnamon brown, they were just produced this past year. So those are your youngest, most vigorous stems, and they're going to give you probably the biggest flowers. The uh, stems that are two years or older are light gray in color, so uh, much like my hair. So uh, or what little of it I have left. So the point is, is that um, you always want to prune the gray stems then, um, but you don't want to prune them all because it's, if it's two or three years old, it's still perfectly good. I mean, it's giving you great flowers. The point is you want to look at the stems that have a lot of branching to them and um, are half an inch or so in diameter at the base. Uh, this one's still very vigorous and looking great, but when the, uh, the old flowers from the previous year are small or pretty much absent, um, you notice that uh, the, the plant is lacking vigor, then that one can be cut to the ground. And, uh, and the, the plant will talk to you. If you just go out there and look at it, you'll suddenly start to see, ooh, that one's lacking a lot of variety. Okay, that one's old, but it's still going, doing good. So, uh, but again, it takes, it takes time, it takes patience. And um, so it's not something that you just run out and say, gee, I've got 15 minutes before my next appointment. I'm going to go prune all my hydrangea macrophyllas. It just doesn't happen. So, uh, so give yourself a little time with that one. So uh, uh, Hydrangea paniculata. Now this one is native to mountaintops of, uh, in Asia, uh, Japan and China. 
And uh, so as a result, it's really cold tolerant. And so, so again, um, if you had a severe winter uh, or something came through and grazed the plant to the ground, uh, the plant would still flower. So you just, this is where, this is the plant response. That's why I'm saying it's important to know where the plant comes from, uh, because if it's warm, then the plant doesn't want to put a lot of production into new wood. It just keeps its older wood and keeps producing flowers um, on the new things that come up from that. Whereas uh, if it's a, it's a uh, colder climate, then it's afraid that it might get damaged or uh, killed to the ground. So then it produces um, flowers on all new wood. So uh, just something to keep in mind. This is up in Ithaca, which is cold country and uh, in a cemetery, but which said no plantings allowed. And there they were very happy. Uh, this is down at uh, Longwood Gardens. And this is one called Unique, obviously. And what take notice that there are they're short to the front, medium in the center and tall in the back. And you go, oh, so what? That's no big deal. But then realize that they cut the plants in the front too short. They cut the ones in the medium to medium height and they cut the ones in the back uh, taller. So they actually pruned it so that it would have this staged appearance. So uh, again, there's horticulture going on here. You just don't notice it right away, but it, there is. And the other thing to notice about is that you can prune back these plants. You notice they're pruned back pretty hard here. You can prune back the plants which have the open panicles uh, quite hard because they don't carry a lot of weight to them, uh, especially when it rains. Whereas plants like limelight, they're going to bow down underneath their a their own weight, but also under uh, heavy rains. So these you don't want to cut back hard because the plant will shoot up a lot of growth. And then the flower head on the top will just weigh the whole thing over and down. So you want to actually cut these back to sort of a structure. And then it will produce two feet, give or take, of new foliage off of that. And thanks to a person that went along and harvested some flowers here, we're actually able to see the structure of the plant. And uh, you'd notice, yeah, this, these stems are holding these flowers up quite proudly. So um, it works quite well. So, uh, so limelight, any of the other really double forms uh, that are have a lot of sterile florets. You don't want to cut back hard to the ground. You just want to cut them back to sort of a structure like um, system. And hydrangea corsifolia, the oak leaf hydrangea. This is native to Georgia, um, you know, parts of the Florida Panhandle and uh, Alabama. And this um, uh, then flowers on previous year's wood because it's growing in a warmer environment. So, um, so this you can only shape. You, if you prune it back hard, you just pruned all the flowers off. Uh, this is snowflake, which is a hose and a hose, very pretty, but it, it has a rather heavy flower, so it tends to weigh down under them. And if you're looking for a lower growing oak leaf hydrangea, ruby slippers, which came out from the National Arboretum, is a great plant. It grows to about four feet tall, doesn't get terribly uh, unruly, and uh, easy to put into your garden. So uh, this might be one that you want to consider. So, uh, it's on the market right now. Excuse me, it's only been out for about uh, eight or so years, 10 years, and uh, super, super plant. And oh, and I should mention, see how the uh, flowers turn pink? So they come out white and then they age nicely to pink, which is a, a big plus. So we're into azaleas, jumping along. Uh, azaleas have this wonderful habit to them, which just tells you this is how the plant wants to be cut. You could cut it right there or you could cut it right there and uh, it's a natural you wouldn't even see the cut so the point is is that when you're looking at this azalea here that's growing out and over the pathway uh obviously this wood here needs to get cut back because you can't walk down this uh, down the trail so um so you, you make one cut and uh, you pass through and you look at it and this is give or take about 10 minutes of work and uh, you look, and you, I'm looking at it, I'm going, gee, you know, this stub here is really standing out and, and is bothersome. And uh, so you go back in and you prune back a little bit more, and now it's it looks natural. That's the point. It's all the flower buds are formed. So if you went in and sheared it, you would remove all the flower buds. So this way you're keeping the natural form of the azalea while at the same time um, heading it back so that it doesn't get out of control. Uh, Rhoda, and here you can see some old uh, Schlipp and Bach eyes, which is a beautiful um, rhododendron here, somewhere around 2010, and um, here it is in 2020. So uh, just cut back hard, literally just sawed them right off at the base. But what it was, it, the plant was telling you that it was time because there was young growth starting to come up at the very base. So we just 
cut all that old wood off. And uh, I know that'll probably pain some people, but look what happened. It came back up and it's it's a beautiful new plant. So you can resurrect old uh, azaleas, rhododendrons, mountain laurels, pieris, andromedas, all of them are very tolerant of this type of pruning. So you can uh, prune them back harsh. Uh, the, uh, the evergreen rhododendrons, uh, especially ones that have become boar ridden, the boars are typically uh, come enter in underneath the branches. <clears throat> You'll see small holes and uh, typically you don't see the effect of the boar until the plant is really stressed as in a drought or something like that. So then just merely go in. Uh, there's a three inch stump right in there. Just cut the plant back to about a foot tall. It'll flush up new growth from the base and you're off and running again. So, um, so it's, yeah, yes, you're gonna, you're gonna reduce the size of the plant dramatically, but you can also do this over several seasons where you can cut the center of the plant out and leave the outer edge. And then as it starts to grow in from the middle, because it's gotten some new light coming down through the plant, uh, then you can take the rest of the, um, the plant away. Uh, holly trees, all hollies, doesn't matter if it's American, Japanese, English, hybrids, uh, they can all be pruned heavily. So if your holly plant has grown too large uh, and has gotten in the way, you can hat rack it. And you can see this plant went all the way out here. And so we cut off about six feet of growth. And it literally looks like something that you could hang your hat on. Uh, the drawback to this is that you don't want to do this without telling your significant other. Uh, because it takes about three years for the plant to come back to look like that, uh, look like something again. Or if uh, you own, uh, work at a country club or a restaurant, someplace where it, uh, you, you, you know, you're not looking for long-term results, you're looking for quick results, uh, this wouldn't go over very well. But you can, it's a very easy way to reduce the uh, size, the width, the girth of the, the holly trees and uh, works out very well. Uh, on this other token, uh, plants like uh, uh, any conifer, so a spruce tree, uh, pine trees, Douglas firs, uh, once you go back beyond where the foliage is, you cannot resurrect it. It will not break dormancy. So on the holly tree, it broke, broke dormant buds on the stems, uh, uh, filled back in again. That does not happen on the conifers. Uh, conifers can be candle pruned. So this is where you take off the new growth, just nip it back. It'll form a new terminal bud and it will look just like nothing had happened to it. And I did this to a plant uh, for 15 years when I was in high school, college, and early years of working. And um, we kept the um, dwarf white pine, which will get to be 20 feet tall, at four feet. So it worked out very well. So just because it's a dwarf pine or a dwarf something doesn't mean it's not going to get to be 20 feet tall. It just means it's not going to get to be 100 feet tall. And as soon as you see a reversion, such as in dwarf Alberta spruce, uh, remove it. Because again, this is what the plant should look like. And this was a um, genetic, uh, well, pretty, pretty much a flaw, but we found it interesting uh, up in Alberta, Canada, it produced one of these dwarf um, twigs to it that we then took and, and uh, reproduced. Uh, but it still wants to every now and then revert back to its original form. And once you see that, you have to remove it or otherwise the whole plant will overgrow. If you have a small tree, dogwoods, crepe myrtles, um, a lot of people tend to really butcher crepe myrtles. They do it down south a lot, and it's just sort of common practice. But they make great looking small trees. This is in Wave Hill at the uh, uh, Riverdale section of the Bronx. And um, they, get, so they get up to about 18, 20 feet tall, a little bit taller down south, but they have great bark and they have great flowers. So you really just want to just clean the branches up. And the one thing that you don't want to do is have branches that go into the center of the plant, because when they do this, uh, they then hit another branch and they start to rub upon each other. <coughs> when they do this, uh, they wear down the bark, which then allows uh, weather to penetrate and you start to get decay. And before you know it, um, you have a dying branch. And so uh, as soon as you start to see branches going towards the inside of a small tree, dogwood, um, maple, uh, Japanese maple, whatever it be, uh, you want to prune those out. And while I mentioned Japanese maples, uh, you want to prune those if you can at all uh, in summer. If you prune them, you know, June, July is fine. Uh, if you prune them now, they'll tend to bleed. And um, 
even the deadwood. So you prune out deadwood, it'll breed. So if you can at all wait on Japanese maples or any of the other dwarf types of maples to uh, midsummer, that's actually beneficial. Anytime you see suckers coming up from the base, remove them because what they're going to do is they're going to want to grow up through the plant and eventually uh, overwhelm the plant. So, um, and it's what it is, is it's typically a, a, a response to a bad a graft union. So, um, the rootstock here is different than what is growing up here. So, uh, there's not enough sugars are getting to the root system. So, the root system just says, you know what? I'm just going to make my own foliage and what happens these grow up through you get a lot of rubbing and then eventually you get a tremendous decline. Also, if the plant is older, like this uh, dogwood here, um, it will try to. Um, help itself by putting up these water sprouts. So suckers come up from the base of the, of the plant where water sprouts come up from the stems. And what it produces all this so that it can get more carbohydrates, more sugars, and that's what it's in need. So you don't want to remove them all and they're going to come up and they're going to rub and they're going to create the issues uh, that you don't want. So what you look at is where, where is this stem going? Well, if this stem continues to grow, will it rub on something up here or will it be fine? And uh, so then you just thin them. You don't cut them all out because the plant will just produce them all over again. So. If you thin them, there's less likelihood of the plant producing so many again in the future because it's now it has new wood to uh, produce the sugars. And, uh, and you can see the pile there at the base. So, um, so that's, you know, that's but years ago I, I had a tree that had a lot of water sprouts on it. I uh, brought a tree company in. They removed all the water sprouts, and the next year it produced them all over again. So there was three thousand dollars down the drain. So. Um, you sort of, you really have to look at the plant and say, what is the plant looking to, what does it want and how can I help it get what it wants? And, uh, so it's, um, sometimes they're very similar to people. So in shade trees, and I'm, we're not advocating climbing trees, but what we're advocating is that when you put a new tree in, uh, what, how do you prune it so that it will grow into a great tree? <laughs> and this is actually good scaffolding. This is good branch work. And uh, it's it's out at 90 degrees from the trunk and you say, wow, that would be really tired. You know, all day long, I have to have my arms out at 90 degrees to the body. You know, couldn't it, if they went straight up, it'd be a lot easier to, to hold the, um, my arms up. But, um, but what happens is that when the, the branches go up, such as in Bradford pears, um, you get all these co-dominant leaders and uh, they start to, as they increase in girth, uh, they then start to push against each other and eventually you're gonna have a failure. So this isn't a pin oak and pin oaks are famous for this as well. Um, so you'll get a branch that'll go straight up and this is what they call included bark. It just means that's bark that's inside between the two different uh, stems. And uh, over time, um, you'll notice if you took a bandsaw and cut this in half, and this is out of Gilman's book, um, you'll notice here that it should be from it there to there down here, but you notice it's so pinched that the plant isn't able to grow and uh, not like here. This is a proper branch structure um, versus uh, a not proper. So uh, what happens over time is that they start to fail. And if you look at a, a proper branch, it, uh, it produces wood that grows down the trunk. And then it produces wood that grows over the, the branch wood. So what's happening is you're getting an interlocking of tissue. Whereas in co-dominant leader, they're both growing without uh, that connection. And so you don't get that strength that you would get with a typical branch. And so uh, when you start to see splitting like this happening, um, it ends up like that and uh, ultimately ends up in the plant most likely dying. So. Uh, and it can be a large failure too. So this was after Hurricane Irene and a lady sent me this uh, picture on her phone. And uh, again, you can see, fortunately that it split out on this side, it's, the other one did split because it would have taken out the house. So, um, and she asked if we, she could save the plant. And my comment was no, because once you open up this much wood uh, and it starts to decay, even if, even if it was able to heal over, uh, the decay is going to remain inside. It's not like human flesh that when you cut it, it heals all the way through. With a tree, it will then compartmentalize the disease, but it will always be weaker, and it will then uh, be a point where the tree will split in the future. So um, they took the tree down. So 
In any case, all is not hopeless as uh, that poor lad leading the path all day long. So if you have multiple stems like uh, on here, um, look at the one that seems to be optimum and remove the other three. And so obviously you wanna do this while it's young in age, but you wanna take it off right there. And then you'll get off to a, a good start. Um, I call this job security because the town came in, cut down the tree that was obviously had issues, put a new tree in, which already has issues. So um, one of these stems should be the predominant uh, leader. And right now you're gonna get a point where uh, as they increase in size and diameter, um, this one, which looks like the weaker of the two will probably split off and you'll have, you'll start all over again with another stump and another tree. So, um, so the point is, is you want to make that cut, um, at this point in its life. And so pick one that you feel would be the appropriate leader, uh, cut off the other one right here and you'll have a safe tree. Uh, it'll look a little odd for the first couple of years, but it's amazing how it fills in. So here, here's your typical branching habit of a yellow wood, not the strongest uh, connection. And so uh, bought one that was on sale and we planted it and it had the same, it had another stem right here coming up. I should have photographed it before I cut it off. I wasn't thinking. So, uh, but we cut it, staked it so that it would uh, get a little bit more upright. Here it was a couple of years later. Here you can see the wood uh, right after cutting it. Here it is uh, a couple of years later, um, healing over nicely. Here it is five years later, and uh, you can see the joint right there. And here it is 10 years later. You can see the joint is pretty much, you can't see it. So the point being is that if when you buy a, a shade tree, it's young, it's uh, it's on sale, or it's the only one left, and you look at it and say, oh, it's, uh, can I cure the problem here? Yes, you can. So uh, when they're young, it's so easy to, to uh, make the corrections. And if it's not uh, a co-dominant, you know, how do you go about pruning trees? Uh, well, interestingly, trees come usually, uh, especially ones that have the proper branch angle, uh, they come with a dotted line that tells you where to cut them. And, um, and you can see it uh, right here on this one. I see right there is dot, 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 you know, it'd be, you know, if the tree had red ink, it would put it, make it a little bit more graceful, but they, they always have this collar and that's a swelling. And inside this collar are a number of different hormones that will then encourage growth of that wood over the cut so that it will heal properly. And you can see it on a young branch. So this one is obviously dead. <clears throat> so it could be cut off here. It's going to take a little longer to heal because it's a bigger uh, cut. Whereas on this red maple here, this cut will uh, will heal in a matter of four years. So uh, uh, also, though, you don't want to take off the lowest uh, branches on a tree when you first put it in because the sugars produced from this branch are going to uh, increase the diameter of the trunk right in here. So it actually helps to stiffen and strengthen the trunk. So when you put a tree in the ground and you want to limb it up, you go, well, I like to get this up to be six feet tall. Don't do it all the first year or second year. Wait, wait five, six years, because uh, you'll get a much stronger trunk that way and, and then cut it off. Um, and you're best to cut it off before it gets over two inches in diameter. But, uh, and here, um, I thought this was interesting that, you know, you here's the pith, which is the center of the branch. And you notice on this plant, it produced all the wood down here and very little up here, because this is where it needed all the engineering, the support to carry the load of the branch. So branches do uh, do not grow symmetrically. They, they grow to support the weight of that branch. So when you look up and you see a five ton branch over, over your head of you, you go, well, is that safe? Well, most, most likely it probably is because the tree is engineered and structured to do that. It's only if you see dead, uh, flaking bark, um, issues of decay, then um, there's a, a real need for worry. And you can see here on, here's a proper branch that had a, a good branch angle. You can see, which is 45 degrees or greater from the trunk. You can see how it's nicely healing because it had a branch collar. Whereas this co-dominant stem did not have a branch collar. So it's gonna take much longer to heal. And this is not tar or paint on that. That's just sort of the, the, the angle of the camera and, and uh, it turned out this way, but you do not want to paint or uh, put tar or anything on um, cuts after you make them, because what will happen is that will crack and then it will produce the perfect environment underneath 
uh, for various bacteria and fungus to grow and actually create decay. So uh, you're much better off just leaving the, uh, the, the cut to weather. Another interesting thing um, is the multi stem trees. And so these have become quite popular and I just sort of like to voice an opinion on this. Um, so, um, so here's our native gray birch, which uh, is, this is on the high line. This is one called white spire, which is, uh, has really nice white bark to it. And um, these get up to about 25 feet tall of, over time that the, the uh, individual trunk will crack or break over and uh, new ones will come up to replace it. And that's, that's exactly how the plant reproduces itself and meant to be. Whereas with river birches, um, what's happening here is there's typically two or three plants, individual plants put into a container uh, to give you this multi-stemmed effect. And river birches want to get to be 60, 80 feet tall. This is not a small plant like the gray birch. This is actually a, a large tree, a shade tree. And so when you have um, these multi-stem trees, uh, what Gilman found out is that um, the roots, these are the roots of the trees, the roots of A uh, do not go underneath B, the roots of C do not go underneath B, and vice versa, B, which is the center stalk here, doesn't go underneath A and C. I remember looking at that going, okay, big deal, what's, what's, what could possibly happen? And, I, and he said A or C would fall down, and I thought, mm, okay, maybe, whatever. But So, uh, so anyway, had this really nice amylank here, uh, which was multi-stemmed. It was planted back in the late 50s, and it was really getting to be a nice size. And after Irene, uh, all of a sudden we noticed that there was a, a hole opening up on one side of the canopy. And then a, a week or two later, we noticed that there was a hole opening up on the other side. And what was happening is that this is three individual plants. The roots from this are not going underneath the center and the roots from this are not going underneath the center. So there's nothing sort of hold it up. So after that uh, heavy uh, wind shaking from Irene, um, you can see that they're just opening right up. And so the, this was, both of these were cut out. <coughs> it's three individual plants. So this plant was not damaged so much by bark splitting. So there was, uh, that was not the issue, but this by the same token, this didn't have any roots that went this way or this way. So a couple of years later, it fell down and uh, classic right out of Gilman's book. And so I said, you know what, there it is. So uh, anyway, took pictures. Um, it was it was a shame, but it um, so again just be careful. I mean, again, this is a 50 plus year old tree, um, and so it's not going to happen in 10 or 15 years. And so if you just put something in the ground and you're moving in five years, you know you don't have to worry about it. But the point is, is if it's uh, something that you want to see mature beautifully, um, sometimes single stem trees are far superior to multi stem. So, and uh, just to finish up, so that you don't think that you have to prune everything under the sun. Some plants are really, really don't need any pruning whatsoever. And uh, so bottle brush buckeye, which this is the most awesome plant ever, um, gets about up to about 25 feet tall, um, slowly spreads to about 50, 60 feet across. But uh, this is one at Old Westbury Gardens in Long Island. But it uh, is deer resistant, it comes on with these wonderful flowers in June and July. Yellow fall color grows in sun or shade is uh, salt tolerant, so you can put it next to roadways. It's just a great, great plant, and it really doesn't require any pruning whatsoever. It's just one of those plants that you just put in the ground, give it proper space, but then just let it go and enjoy it. And we've planted it on either side of deer fencing uh, to sort of hide the fence, and it works great. So we we haven't had any. Uh, this is up in um, uh, Morris County. We haven't had any issues with the deer eating it and they're, they're quite ample. Um, pepper bush, the clethra, I mentioned this one before we started out with Ruby Spice, which was that pink one. Um, this is a low growing one called hummingbird. So if you don't want your pepper bush to get tall, uh, hummingbird and 16 candles are two great forms, which only get up to about 16 to 24 inches tall. But again, uh, we experimented with cutting them back hard to see if we can get renewal growth coming up from the base. And uh, they were very slow to uh, regenerate. So they do not like being cut back. Um, they produce flowers in midsummer, so they produce uh, flower buds on new wood. Uh, but again, you don't want to um, prune them you know, ex uh, excessively in the springtime because they're not going to recover well. You could take a branch off here or there that's in the way, but you don't want to be 
uh, exceptionally brutal. And they have the most wonderful sweet smelling flowers. So uh, pepper bush is just, uh, and the seeds look like pepper. That's why they call it pepper bush. Uh, Dravilla, another underused uh, native plant, uh, grows along streams and banks, great ground cover, small yellow flowers in midsummer, great for pollinators, and never needs to be pruned. It just grows happily, gets up to about two and a half feet tall, and uh, purplish fall color. Uh, why it's not used more probably just doesn't look all that sexy in a number two or three can in the garden centers in May. And here we have uh, Henry's Garnet uh, Sweet Spire, uh, Virginia Sweet Spire, which again, super, super plant. Uh, red stems in the winter, great uh, red fall color, flowers in May into June that are fragrant and long and drooping. Uh, it's native, pollinators love it, and it really requires nothing. It, doesn't, it did not require this. So uh, this was up at a golf course and the uh, superintendent caught one of the uh, employees um, going out and shearing the plants when they just didn't need to be. They just were... It was a low maintenance thing. Just let them grow and sucker, and uh, they get up to about four feet tall. And uh, and here you can see the fall color coming on. So, uh, so the point of all this was just sort of hopefully to help you um, produce, you know, happy plants, not sad plants. Um, a lot of time, it's really about focusing on the plant. Um, you know, sort of zen-like. It's becoming one with the plant, but. Uh, look on small trees, uh, especially look for crossing branches. You want all the branches to go outward on multi stem shrubs, which is most of your shrubs. Um, then you just want to know whether do they bloom on previous year's wood or current seasons wood um, on how to prune them back uh, so that you have flowers for the coming year. Um, typically, you thin them, so remove out the oldest canes so that again, they'll develop tyloses and tend to die off with time. Uh, or produce smaller and smaller and smaller flowers. And so, uh, um, so anyway, you, you always want your plants uh, like kids to grow healthier. And, and uh, this was my son when he was in early college, which uh, supported a nice goatee, which I didn't think set him up very well, but uh, he figured out how to use a shaver eventually and uh, got himself all pruned up. So, so this is, uh, um, and none of them, by the way, went into uh, horticulture. So uh, uh, he's an analyst, she's a nurse, and he's an engineer. So um, they're all doing great, but. Uh, didn't, didn't follow the green the green path. Uh, and here's my email. So if we don't get to your question tonight, um, feel free to email me, and uh, uh, I'm happy to respond and answer any questions whatsoever I can. So, so Susan, do we have some questions? Do we have some questions? Yes, we do. Um, there's there's quite a few, and I want to thank you, Bruce. That was awesome. I think. You really, I, I was impressed at your timing because it's just 803 now. So that was pretty good. <laughs> um, I tried. But in, in any case, um, just a lot of information in a short amount of time. And it's hard because there were a lot of specific questions in the chat or in the uh, Q&A. So um, I have one and then uh, Patty, if you have some, and then Rebecca, if there's any that you come up with. Um, one was more about um, cabling. Uh, somebody at the end just asked about cabling a river birch. Okay. Is that, would that be something you would not necessarily, I mean, I know it depends on the plant, but. It, it will work. Uh, I have seen it done and they, they will work for a period of time. So it, it'll, it'll buy you a few years. Um, and uh, so it's, so yes, the answer is yes, it will, it will work. But again, uh, the biggest plant I saw was up at the Arnold Arboretum. It was enormous. Uh, it had a di diameter at breast height, BBH. Uh, that was about two and a half feet. So, um, so when you look at those individual small stems and those those uh, three or four multi-stem plants, uh, just think about them getting to be two feet in diameter, at chest height, and you'll realize that there, there's a lot of pressure going to happen. So, that's that's a big tree. <laughs> that's a big tree. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Patty, did you have one you want to pop up? Um, Harry was asking how to prune honeysuckle. Uh, so that would be honeysuckle vine, I am assuming. So, um, so they, they bloom on previous year's wood and current season. So you would your best to actually thin them. So, uh, same thing with, uh, uh, the clematis. So someone probably has a question on that. Um, so a lot of, uh, clematis blooms on some of them species bloom on previous year's wood. So they bloom in May. So those you do not want to prune until after they flowered. Uh, those that bloom in June and uh, to August, those bloom on previous year's wood and current season's wood. So those you thin 
and those that bloom in the autumn are all on new wood, so those you can prune harshly in the spring. And the same thing is true with the honeysuckle. So if you if you're a honeysuckle, you see blooms in May. Um, it's blooming on previous year's wood. Um, if it blooms for you in um, June, uh, then it's current. But most of them start to bloom for you in May, so they're blooming on previous year's wood. So you want to thin them. Okay. Okay. So Rebecca, do you have one? It's okay. I'm putting you on the spot. I know. No, it's fine. I'm I'm still typing. So. <laughs> um, I'll oh, give you another okay. one. I, I haven't. Have you. <laughs> so, Rebecca, keep you. You keep freezing, Becca. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. All right, go ahead, Patty. Right, we have one here. It says, "Dear prune the leader of one of my green giant arborvitaes. What can I do to get another leader growing?" Uh, green giant is quite vigorous. It's it's a cross, so uh, it should form one on its own. Um, I'm not sure how big a chunk of wood it came off. Uh, you can take a side branch and um, uh, sort of splint it so it uh, so that goes up as the leader. Um, if you do that for about three to four years, um, it will not, the, the roping that you use will not dig into the branch excessively, so it won't cause any problem, but just make sure that you do remove the splint. Uh, but that will allow you to get a new leader coming up. And that's one of the beauties of that plant is it is a nice single stem, single leader plant. Okay. Okay. I don't know if Rebecca's unfrozen. <laughs> if you have a question, go ahead, Becca. Now there must be a delay. I see it's um, smiling. Did, I don't think we um, I'm actually the, still uh, uh, I'm, it, can you hear me now? No. You, okay. You just keep cutting out. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying, Becca. <laughs> can you hear me now? Okay. It's just slow. Okay. All right. I'll just Go ahead, Patty. Answers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, somebody asked about pruning Magnolia grandiflora. Uh, so that that actually prunes very well and responds very well. Uh, a lot of people don't think to prune magnolias because they think that they, um, which again on large on large wounds because it is a, a rather primitive plant, uh, they don't heal well. But on um, Southern Mag, they uh, heal really well. So if you want to take wood off for the holidays, um, you know, from no November, December, use them in wreaths or whatever have you, uh, they they prune beautifully. And uh, I, my personal favorite is Bracken Brown's Beauty uh, for this neck of the woods. It uh, has a nice upward shape to it, so it fills in quite nicely and it takes pruning beautifully. So, and you could prune off uh, stems that are two to three feet long on uh, Southern Mag without a problem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, works out quite well. If it's a large limb that you're taking off, um, it, it'll respond to, but uh, you might get some water sprouts coming up from the, where you made the cut. Okay. All right. I have uh, another one from Rosalind. Um, she was asking about Japanese use, but somebody else was asking about regular use as uh, regular taxes as well. You mentioned it a little bit early on, but then people started getting in there. So um, can you just talk, can you top, I think she was asking about low straggling stems towards the bottom. Can you cut those up or, um, do you need to cut only from the top? No, you can if you want to limit up into a, a small tree. So uh, the uh, European, uh, the the English yew, and the Asian yew, or the crosses, all of them take uh, pruning beautifully. If you can want to make them into a small tree, they do great with that. They have nice exfoliating bark. Um, I think the English yew tend to have a little bit more orangey bark to it than the, the crosses, but still. Um, a wonderful tree. If you want to do it that way, that way you beat out the deer until they figure out how to use a, a ladder. Uh, but, um, but yeah, no, uh, uh, taxes was a great, great plant. And, uh, until the deer came along and, it, you know, really reduced its, its usage. They, they did, they did. Uh, Patty, you have another one? Um, we just got one from Sandra. When do you cut back Wygelia? So Igelia um, is you want to treat that like forsythia. You've got to thin that. So uh, it uh, again, it's produced its flowers on the previous year. Uh, if and 
you know, there are some that have red foliage to them, which again, you could cut the whole thing to the ground and just let it uh, be a red foliage plant. But um, but the the flowers look so great against the red foliage. So you're you're better off just thinning it. So just take out a, up to a third of the wood each season and allow it to sucker up from the base. Okay, I had one about a uh, so a she a couple of people asked about a mock orange. Um, about pruning a mock orange, but also I, I know we're not supposed to give names of where to buy it, but do you have any suggestions on like what kind of places to find mock orange? So that, that's one of those plants that um, was so popular back in the 50s and early 60s and then fall for, uh, fell from grace because uh, if you're not there in the two weeks, it's blooming and never sells. So, um, so offhand, I do not know. Uh, of a source for that, um, but the you again you prune that just like the wajelia, just like the forsythia. So you just thin out some of the oldest wood. Um, I, I would just call around to local garden centers, um, especially if you. I'm not sure where you you live, but if you have a, a specialty um, nursery that that uh, sort of prides themselves on odd to find things. Uh, and call now. Um, don't wait for them to get stuff in. Say, you know, I'm looking for X, and they might be able to add it to an order. So uh, it might be something that Monrovia Nurseries, uh, which is a huge wholesale nursery, uh, carry, but uh, they could just add that to their to their order. So it might be worth mm -hmm. a shot. I think mail order. I know I've seen it in mail order catalogs, but I haven't. I know it's an older plant too, and I know it can get a little unruly. So oh, yeah. I, I, so it may not be easy to find, but. Um, the fragrance is the die for. <laughs> it is. It is. It's that my mom had one. Um, Lorraine, uh, sorry, and then Patty, if you want to go. Um, Lorraine asked about willows and dogwoods. Um, she asked early on a, a third of old. So she wants to know if the if you prune that a third of old wood to the ground, or do you just prune it a little bit to the ground? So the ground. Uh, so yeah. So if you Wherever you take it back to, it, the older bark is going to be gray. So I've seen some where they take them back to two feet. And again, the whole interest on those plants is the winter time. So you're going to see a gray stem to two feet and then going to have red foliage from, or um, uh, red stems from there. So you really want to take the plant right back to six inches off the ground, give or take, or less. Okay. And spirea the same. I know that popped up too, spirea. Spirea depends on the one that you have. Um, so the bridal wreath spirea that blooms on previous year's wood um, has those small double flowers that bloom in May. And uh, so that you want to thin or just you say, okay, I'm just going to renewal prune it and I'm going to forfeit the flowers for this year and it'll, it'll grow back. That's fine. Uh, many of the other spireas, the ones that bloom all summer long, they bloom on new wood. So you can you can cut them back annually um, and they'll flush right back up and bloom for you. So. Um, but yeah, if you have bridal wreath, that's that's one of the few that I know that does bloom on previous years. Okay. Patty, did you have any of it? I'm sure I have a few more. I just have a couple pages to look for. <laughs> um, one just came in about pruning. It keeps popping away from me, but it's about pruning osmanthus. Um, okay. How to keep it kind of small on the smaller side, and will it bloom if it has been pruned often? So, uh, so when you uh, prune it often, you produce a lot of vigorous growth, and that will in turn um, not bloom. So, uh, so you want to uh, go with, with the smaller ones. So there's one called Party Time, which uh, has new foliage that comes out in pinks and purples. Uh, I've seen that mail order, and also stumbled upon it in a couple of nurseries and. Uh, uh, it looks typical uh, osmanthus the rest of the season, but it's just the new spring growth is pretty and then it flowers. Uh, Goshiki is another one which uh, has white and green foliage, gets up to about uh, six. Well, over time it'll get to about eight feet tall, but it's it's not a giant, so uh, that one you can prune lightly. Uh, we used to prune that uh, all the time for uh, holiday decorations, and it did it, great. The uh, light prune is still flowering. So, um, uh, so, yeah, but if you prune them like a hedge and you prune them hard each year, uh, Longwood Gardens does that uh, by their parking lot. They have hedges of the uh, of golf tie, which they prune heavily, and that does never really flowers because uh, it's growing too vigorously. Um, I had uh, quite a few different crate myrtle questions, which you kind of covered them, but could you just go over again the, like, what's the preferred 
pruning time on a crepe myrtle? So crepe myrtles, I, I treat like a small tree, so I thin out the crossing branches on them. And, and if you have the time and the ladders, you can, uh, you know, climb up and cut off the seed pods, which uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion now that they look ornamental because I don't want to climb up anymore. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when I was 10 years younger, I would go up and cut them all up. But, um, but the, um, a lot of times down south, they'll just take the plant and they'll cut it in half each year. And, uh, and that has been proven to actually cause decline. And uh, yeah. so you don't want to do that. Uh, they're an extremely tough plant. You can plant them down medians in the middle of highways and they do fantastic. So, uh, so really, it's just a matter of removing the crossing branches, starting when you're, they're young. I mean, don't start when it's you know, 10 feet tall. Uh, when you first get it and it's two to three feet tall, determine which one you want to be the leader. Uh, again, I like to grow them as a single stem plant. And because uh, I've had them split on me as multi stems under snow load yeah. up here, and uh, they, they don't do it down south, um, but up in um, especially as you get into Morris County, which is sort of the northern edge, they tend to split up. So, um, and that's really about it. They're 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 pretty easy. Um, if I can remember the name of it, I'm not going to. Um, there's a couple of dwarf ones that are pink. Um, yeah, it's not going to come to me. Um, which you could uh, coppice or stool back annually, because uh, again, they produce wood on new growth. So if you have a dwarf one that only gets to be six to eight feet tall at maturity, uh, then that you could cut back annually without a problem. Mm -hmm. And, and I know if anybody's uh, looking for crepe myrtles that you do have to watch in trade. You're hoping up here in northern Jersey and, and you know, Pennsylvania and some of the other states that are watching that you want to make sure it is hardy for your area because they are more of a southern plant. So sometimes up here you can get a lot of dieback. So you want to be careful about that. Yeah, I've used Natchez, which is the white one, um, uh, all over the place. And I've had great success with that. So. Mm -hmm. Cherokee Chief was, uh, no, not Cherokee Chief. Uh, Oh, Centennial Spirit was one of my favorite lilac-y lavenders. Uh, oh. It's hard to find, but it really pretty bark too, but not just as beautiful bark. Oh, That's gonna, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll give one more and before any, and then if anybody else has one, I saw that a uh, four foot inkberry holly hedge. Um, sorry, I just, oh, of course I just moved it to too little. Um, they were asking about, uh, can you cut that, you know, it's top heavy. Yep. So should you cut it all the way down or is it something to restart? Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, so again, that's a holly. So you can cut that to the ground. It'll flush back up as soon as it starts to flush. Start pruning it. So you don't want it to flush to two feet, and because uh, it'll just have these stalks growing up straight. So as soon as it starts to come up, start pruning it. So excuse me. So you start to get a, a dense mass of stems on it. Um, that's what I'm, that's what it does. It's very holly likes to become a top heavy plant when you see it down the pine barrens um, it's not terribly attractive um, it's great native plant great for pollinators but um i know there's some uh prince and nurseries put out one years ago called compacta which is still on the market you see that here and there but that still gets to be a little top heavy but uh, there's some others that are on the market that are supposed to stay more compact but regardless they can all be cut to the ground and, and renewed um, very easy plant to grow okay all right uh, go ahead, Patty, do anything? I mean, I see a bunch of different ones in here, but I'm not sure some of them we've answered and some of them we haven't. So I might have to go back through after tomorrow and tomorrow. But yeah. did Patty, did you find me? Yeah, there's there's still quite a few in here. Um, one is someone has an ornamental flowering terry. How to how to prune it to reduce the spread? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um the trouble is when you start pruning cherries, you, you can get canker, um, and uh, which is sort of the-, the And the you probably will get canker. Of cherries, yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah, I mean, if it's if it's push comes to shove and you have to reduce the spread, then yes, uh, tip it, you know, take the branch back, the longest branch back to a side branch. Um, and that, that'll, as much as you can, so it has a natural appearance. I know it's- Hard to communicate this verbally, but um, as you stand there, I always like I always joke, but it's true. You sort of become one with the plant, and you know what do you prune <laughs> that will take the weight off and so forth. So, um, but yeah, just be careful of canker with that because uh, once you start to get it, it's um, it's it's near impossible to er eradicate it. Okay. Um, there were there's a couple of things, but I know one that popped up. Uh, Leyland cypress kept popping up. Um, Leyland Cypress and then Arborvitae, which I know you answered about the one Arborvitae, but um, apparently uh, somebody had a Leyland that's, that, that somebody cut really hard, almost back to no green. Um, 
and I know sometimes they do come back. Sometimes I guess it also depends. I asked her to send pictures, but is there anything mm -hmm. you'd like to comment? Because Leyla and Cypress are known to be around and everywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, Leyla and what uh, One Tree Company was doing that really seemed to be good with it was they were thinning it to allow the air passage to go through. So that will re reduce some of the, the disease pro uh, problems with it. Um, they, I, I've seen Leyland used in hedging. Um, so it can be pruned, sheared quite heavily and hard. So chances are it probably will re-sprout for you um, as long as it's vigorous and healthy. Um, with uh, arborvitaes, if someone has multi-stemmed arborvitaes, that seems to be another problem um, that have, people have. Which only is on the east eastern arborvitae, uh, which is our native. Uh, the west coast arborvitae is generally a single trunk, but for some reason, our east coast they like to uh, nurserymen like to grow it as a multi-trunk plant. Then they split apart, so there's really nothing that you can do there short of cabling it. So um, if you got snow load this winter and your arborvitae sort of splitting apart, um, the the best thing you do is try to cable it or you know thin the head a little bit to reduce some of the loads, so maybe it'll bounce back up, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I had there was another um, two questions actually that kind of are similar. Uh, one about deer browse and deer deer damage, but also um, salt damage, salt pruning <laughs> from uh, from the you know people that are on the waterfronts around here. Um, so it would you know um, what would you recommend if if somebody had like a lot, a lot of winter burn or, or or deer browse? What would you just try to shape it to shear it uh, to, to to shape it? I guess. Not yeah, sure. just wait, uh, especially with the salt, just wait to see what breaks bud in the spring and then cut back to that. There's nothing much you can do there. And then with deer browse, um, yeah, you just have to try to protect it in the future from that. Um, and um, and then look at, you know, if you have salt damage, look to, and if, if it's a constant thing, then start to look to trees that are a little bit more salt proof. Uh, I remember after uh, Sandy, I went down to Bayhead uh, to give a talk. Um, because everybody was depressed about all the dead trees. And there was a southern magnolia that looked, it had water, salt water up to it, four to five feet tall. It looked like nothing had happened to it. It was as happy as a plant. And so there are some plants that are incredibly salt tolerant. So okay. Work okay. Um, I don't uh, girls, uh, I mean, do you see anything else that really jumps out that we should address tonight or? I think I got everything on my list. Uh, rhododendrons, that was always another one. That was, you know, a really old 40 foot, uh, 40 year old one. I mean, again, we, we know if you cut back the flowers, you know, if you cut now, you're cutting back the flowers, but I guess it depends on what they need to do. What would your suggestion? Yeah, uh, so if if, uh, if you're shaping them, they always say to prune just as the flowers are fading. Um, but again, that's one of the busiest times of the year. So if, uh, if you're a keen gardener, that you might lose that weekend. Um, the uh, I, I tend to prune them now and just say, okay, we're going to sacrifice the flowers on this one this year. If if uh, if the size though is important, you know, it's 40 years old and you want to keep the large size, then uh, you know, inspect for bores, uh, mulch it, keep the ground moist, uh, get a soil test, make sure that you're acidic and you have the proper nutrients, and uh, um, because sometimes those big old magnificent ones, you don't want to lose the size on them. So that, that's the important part. Um, and you may want to do a little bit of pruning on the inside to encourage some inner growth, you know, up on the very top canopy. I don't know if my camera's on or not, but on the very top canopy, if you cut a little bit out that allows some light to come into the plant, that in turn will allow new wood to grow inside the plant and uh, okay. it will constantly regenerate itself a little bit. Oh, great. That's good. I, I forgot about that, that that would work too. Um, I know we keep losing Rebecca, so I'm sorry, Rebecca, but I can't ask you to, to pop in there and ask any questions in particular. But um, I really, um, unless Patty, is there anything else in particular? I just want to say the last little jazz we can wrap um, up. Yeah, I mean, there's there's still more. I mean, I don't think we covered Abelia. Oh, no, we didn't cover Abelia. Oh, Abelia's Someone good. Someone was asking about Abelia. So that, that blooms on new wood. So you can cut that right to the ground and uh, it'll flush back up. There are some like Rose Creek that are a little less hardy. Um, so this being a, a rather, you know, snow, well, I don't know. It depends where you were, but uh, <laughs> um, Rose Creek may not come back vigorously from old wood. So you may have to cut that back anyway and let it grow up from the base. 
But um, but yeah, the abelia is just a super tough plant, and uh, so if it's gotten gnarly and sort of overgrown or you know you don't want to do with it, just cut it back and let it flush right up again, and you'll be fine. Okay. Well, I, I know there's like so many things, that, but I think what I'm going to I think I'm going to cut us off here only because um, I wanted to mention that Rutgers um, does have. Um, our publications, Rutgers publications, that you can find a lot of um, things that we're discussing in, um, there's a pruning fact sheet for shrubs, um, talking about how to prune them and when to prune them versus spring versus some, there were a couple of people that asked for a plant list. Um, so we tried to put that into the Q&A so that it would pop up for everybody the link. So if anybody's looking for those particular things, give us, um, you can email me. A lot of people, y'all have my email now at this point. Bruce's email was on the end there. Uh, Rebecca, anybody in Hunterton County is welcome to contact um, Rebecca as well. And each in, in New Jersey, every county has an extension. Um, if you know you can't, you know just you can you know call them up if you don't know how to find them. Uh, just put RCE of whatever your county is, and uh, you can search there to get the phone number to call the office or uh, go on their website. And then for those of you guys that are out of state, Penn State, there are there every state has an extension. So if you have specific questions that you need to answer in your particular area, please um, utilize your extension service. That's what we're here for, um, and that helps keep us going and keeping us uh, being able to present these uh, presentations for you, Bruce. Again, I, you're always I always I always find something new and I learn something every time. Um, yeah, we have fun. I know one of these days, hopefully we can go on a road trip to a garden and just have, you know, a big, you know, garden tour with Bruce. <laughs> Someday we'll do that again. <laughs> yes, yes, we will. So again, um, anybody that's uh, still on, if you would like to, uh, there's a survey afterwards. So if you could please fill that out and if you can always put your extra questions in there. And also um, we do, our next talk will be on April 20th, will be figs. And that would be me uh, growing figs in the home garden. So um, Bruce, I may be hitting you up for some uh, tips on that one um, because yeah, um, as much as I do know some horticulture stuff, figs are not a favorite of mine, to be honest, be honest, but we will get through, but there's a lot, we always get a lot of questions in at the office. So um, a lot of stuff that we can answer. So that's a good thing. So thank you again and uh, great presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you everybody. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, and Rebecca, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Rebecca, thank you so much. She, she was able to answer a lot in in chats in the uh, Q and A privately, so thank you so much. It was it was a hundred, let's say, one hundred fifty eight questions there, Bruce. That's what we had today. So we'll be sending some your way. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thanks again, everybody. Good night, thank everybody. You. Good night, everybody.